Welcome everyone to our Teaching and Learning Commons workshop on the Flip Classroom. I'd like to introduce my colleagues here from Teaching and Learning Commons and our panelists for today. So this is Dave Murphy, Instructional Designer in Teaching and Learning Commons. I'm Jenny Douglas. I work with faculty and graduate student support. This is Natalie Rwamba, a doctoral student in Curriculum and Instruction, and Amy Kuhn, who also works with faculty and graduate student support. And I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Kirk Hazen from the Department of English, Tara Wetzel from the School of Pharmacy, and Mike Walsh from the Department of Marketing. And this workshop is a follow-up to a mini-series that we've been putting together on the idea of what the flipped classroom is and how faculty members might think about that as a pedagogical tool and a technique for teaching. And so we're recording this today partly because a great number of people said, we really wish we could come, but we can't be there right now. So this recording of the panel discussion is going to go up on the Teaching and Learning Commons YouTube channel, which is brand new, part of our resources. And um, the Teaching and Learning Commons website also just went up this week. So that's a wonderful development, tlcommons.wvu.edu. And we'll be continuing to add a lot of resources to the site as we get moving. A couple of just brief things to say about initiatives that are coming up. Um, very good news for us. We will be starting to coordinate the Provost Office Faculty Development Series through the Teaching and Learning Commons now. So as faculty members, if you have topics you would like to see or topics you'd like to present, um, that faculty development series and the Faculty Academy Week in May, which is generally a week-long series of workshops in May, will now be coordinated through the Teaching and Learning Commons, so we're very, very excited about that. And also, as you go back to your own departments, if you have topics that you're interested in, please let your colleagues know that we'd be happy to come in and have consultations with you individually or as departments on any topic that you're interested in discussing. And we can help look for resources or just you know, chat with you about issues that you're having or questions you'd like to discuss. And we're very much interested in your, in your input because we're, we're partners for you and we want to make sure that we're working with you as well as we can. So in terms of our workshop format today, I asked the panelists to consider two things. Um, the first was just their general course organization, how they work with the idea of the flipped classroom and what strategies do they use. So they're each going to talk a little bit about their in-class strategies and how their course is organized. And then the second thing I asked them to talk about was generally just pros and cons. What does it mean for the for the teaching load, for the student expectations to organize the class in the, the way that they're doing it. So I think we'll proceed with that. After that, this is really an, an interactive workshop, so we've built in a lot of time for you to ask questions, to discuss individually with any of the panelists, or to just you know pick, your, pick our brains and brainstorm with us about questions that you might have, or just lessons that you're thinking about developing for your course. So we're basically here as a resource today, once we've heard from the panelists, to help you think through questions that you might have going forward. So with that, I think I will turn the discussion over to Tara Wetzel from Pharmacy to kick us off in talking about how she organizes her course. Thank you. So I've been teaching in this manner for three years now. I just we're wrapping up our the third time I've, I've done the course in this manner. When I started doing this, I did not know it was a flipped classroom. I just was bored with teaching it in the old traditional manner and wanted to do something different. Only recently discovered that it's actually called a, a flipped classroom. <laughs> so the course is a, a three credit hour course and it's taught in the um, fall semester of the third year of our professional program. Um, prior to changing it, it was your traditional met three days a week for an hour or for 50 minutes um, and was mostly lecture based with trying to, to incorporate some cases or discussions or other types of things, but the majority of it was 
lecture base and I find that I was you know I found that I was just doing the same lecture over and over and it was was boring um, so I wanted to to change it so in the fall of 2011 was the first time that we implemented or that I implemented the the new design and at the time I just thought it was a, a hybrid design I have an online component and an in-class component so it's still a three credit hour course but we only meet for two hours a week. Uh, we meet on Wednesdays for one two-hour block. And then approximately one hour a week, there are online lectures that the students watch on their own time. They are to watch them prior to the, the class period that week so that they come to class having viewed the online content and have some knowledge of it. And then they come to class and we work on applying that knowledge to, to cases and other, other types of, of activities. The format that I use for most of my um, in-class things is, um, is TBL. So team-based learning has been incorporated into the, to the course. Um, I group topics by week. So one week, for example, um, this is a non-prescription drug course. So one week, for example, we'll cover allergies and cough and cold. We'll do that all in one week. So they view the online lectures related to those topics prior to, to coming to, to class. Um, I use SOL, which is the Health Science Center's online um, course management system. And on Seoul, I post for the students um, reading assignments, the online lectures are posted there, any learning objectives that they need. Um, sometimes there will be links to external sites, maybe an FDA advisory or something like that. So it's all organized by, uh, by week. So all the content that they need for that week's topics are in one folder in the um, online course management system. I also use in-class slide sets that contain like key points and really just kind of help to keep the class organized and I'll post those there also. As I mentioned, I use team-based learning for um, six weeks um, during the semester we use the team-based learning. And so the students come into class having prepared ahead of time, and the first thing that they do is take an individual readiness assurance test, um, which is the, the IRAT, and they do that online. It's a 10-item, multiple-choice questions. Um, about half of it is just basic recall types of things, and about half is um, you know, getting at some real basic application types of, of things. Um, and after they complete the IRAT, the next thing they do is a TRAT. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the um, with team-based learning. The TRAT and IRAT are the same quiz. The IRAT they take on their own, um, and then the TRAT they do as their as a team. And so my teams right now, the way the room is structured, the teams are a little larger than I would like. There's uh, seven to eight students per team. That's because we have 12 tables and they hold eight people, um, and so I have t I have 12 teams. Um, the team test is a paper-based test, so they have a, a paper, and they use these um, scratch-off cards. You want to pass that around? Um, these scratch-off cards are called IFAT. They're immediate feedback assessment technique, and so the students know when they're doing this as a team, they know right away whether they got it right, and so then they can discuss, okay, well, why didn't we get it right? Um, and then they can scratch off a, their second choice. And they do get partial credit um, as long as they get it before the fourth try. <laughs> if they need four tries, they don't get any credit for that. Um, so they do get partial credit. So um, they, I found that they actually like this part of it because they, they get that immediate feedback and it allows them to discuss it and allows all of them to see, okay, yeah, I get why that's the, the correct answer. So that part they like. Uh, following the TRAT, um, while the teams are doing that, I can view the IRAT results on online um, immediately. And so while they do the TRAT, I review the IRAT and look at like the worst questions. So which questions did a lot of them miss? And during the mini lecture, we'll talk about those specific questions. What were some of the, um, the key points from the online material that maybe weren't so clear to them? What did they not get? Um, what do I need to, to review or kind of reemphasize? The mini lecture will also review um, you know, important or difficult concepts and then if there's any new information, maybe a new product has been brought to the market that wasn't included in the reading material or wasn't really mentioned in the online lecture and so we'll talk about that during class. 
And then after the mini lecture, which might be five to ten minutes, um, maybe a little bit longer sometimes, um, sometimes a little shorter. After that, they'll do application exercises. And these are often case-based types of things, and I have some examples I can share with you um, as well. And during their application exercises, they talk about um, these in their, in their teams. And then once the teams are done, usually I give them, depending on what they're doing, they'll have um, 8 to 15 minutes to work on the application exercises. And then we'll, um, we'll talk about those. And usually what I have the teams do is report what their results were. So I use a, a folder to help organize the team. So each team has a folder. Inside the folder are just colored index cards. So orange might indicate A. So we talk about the first case. I ask, okay, well, what did the teams, um, what did you choose as the answer? And if they chose A, then they just hold up their card. So I can see immediately around the room whether all the teams pick the same answer or not, and then we'll have a discussion about that particular case. And the cases are designed to illustrate a, a key concept, you know, what's something that I want to make sure that they understand and can apply to actual patients. Um, so we'll talk about that, we'll review key points, and then we'll move on to the next set of application exercises. And then we try to summarize the main points from the class at the end. Um, as I mentioned, I only do TBL six weeks out of the semester. The other times we don't have an IRAT, TRAT, but we do do application exercises and other team-based activities, um, but not the IRAT, TRAT. So that's kind of the format that I have for, for my course. Do we want to take any questions now or wait till everyone talks about the format of their, of how they've done the flipped class? Any, any immediate questions for Tara? So are your teams always, uh, they keep always the same, the same people or yes. they vary? Okay. So the, the teams are the same throughout the semester. Uh -huh. Prior to the start of the semester, I randomize them to, to teams. And because I'm not familiar with the third year students, I don't really see them much as first or second year students. I send that, um, that randomization to other faculty members that are a lot more familiar just to make sure if there's any, you know, conflicts <laughs> such as you know used to be dating and now aren't or don't get along well we're on another team together had major issues they can inform me of that before I send it out to, to the class so I put them in their teams ahead of time and they start the very first day of class sitting in their team and then they they uh, keep that team for the whole semester helps them build cohesiveness and then there's also peer evaluation at the end so if you don't participate in your team activities, you lose, your teammates will call you out on that and you'll lose some points. Any other? You have 96 students in this class? I have 86. 86 students. Mm -hmm. okay. I have 86 students. Yeah, you have teams of seven and eight. Okay. Seven, okay. yeah, seven and eight. So there's 86 of them. Yeah. So it's a big group to manage, but it's worked pretty well. I'm a student of counting their uh, team evaluation. They're the peer evaluations that they do, it's a, uh, maybe around 3% or so, I think. It's over 20 points out of, I can't even remember how many points are total in my course. Um, so it's about the same as, it's the same as two T-RATs. The T-RATs are each worth 10 points apiece. So it's enough that if, that you could, it can, you know, if you're borderline, it could drop you down, um, I agree, but not so much that that's going to hurt you that much. Yeah. Now that they'll do before their final. So, yeah, they still do that. <laughs> um, let's go to Kirk. All right. Um, I was wondering why I was chosen to do this, and now I see I'm the old-fashioned guy in, in lots of ways. Um, so this will be somewhat of a contrast. I, I don't believe I actually have any acronyms in my <laughs> presentation, so I, I'm lacking <laughs> in, in some departments. Um, so, here's my overall primary goal in education for my students and for me. Basically, the idea is I want them to see the kinds of complexity that's all around them, understand that we don't understand it, and then work forward from there. I work with language, and it's one of those continually humbling experiences 
where, oh, I got a PhD, look how little I know. And you just keep rolling with that. And you help, you help students build tools so they can do their own analysis and then go on and learn what they can learn because you're just not gonna get it all. Um, so my main goal in the classroom is to provide them opportunities. So in my overall idea of what I do, I'm providing them opportunities and, and then we work from there. Um, I do that with the idea that I'm coaching them in some way. I like coaching sports also and I've um, been intermittently teaching people my specific children people, music for, for years with other actual experts' help. And this metaphor works really, really well for me in the classroom because it puts a lot of the responsibility for education with the students as budding adults. And I like that, they sometimes like that, and there's some ups and downs for that which come up later. But it could be sports, it could, the metaphor could work well with learning an instrument, it, either way. Um, a couple of assumptions here, coaches prepare players for performances. So these classroom experiences are places where the coaches help the students practice. And the practices are about setting up structured activities for them to develop skills. And again, you can see there's going to be ups and downs with setting up a situation like this for students. Uh, the players certainly need to practice to develop their skills. And the coaches can do some, some things. They can demonstrate techniques in practice. They can set up drills that help the players develop very specific skills. Um, but come performance time, it's really up to the students to, to do it. The coaches can't take the test, the coaches can't play the games, they can't actually um, perform on stage. It's up to the students. And helping the students realize that is part of this, part of this model. I'm going to give an example here. Uh, I teach, this is from a class called the English Language, it's English 221, it's a very basic intro to language class. It's not set up to teach someone how to be a linguist. It's set up to explain how language works. If it were biology, it would be intro to life versus intro to biology. Um, in this class, the main advantage I have over, let's say, um, biology or physics is that the students are walking around with all of this data in their head that they can analyze at any time. They have the language with them. And they're great language analyzers in the first place. Helping them realize that then is a part of this job. So here's an example. Um, I want you to look at this word, dehumidifier. I want you to break it down into its parts, its meaningful parts. So go ahead, do that in your head. See what you can get out of it. And what we're gonna work on is how do these different parts fit together? Okay, by the way, how many parts are you breaking it into? Three parts, you got three parts, we saw four? Three, four, anybody for five? Three. Okay, well, let's take a look. Um, so the local goal here is both how to analyze it and then how we're supposed to model how the mind puts together these parts in a hierarchical organization. Describing that, helping them understand what the hierarchy is, is you know, a challenge, but you do it through these kinds of exercises. So let's take a look. Um, what's the first part you guys would make it divide? Going left to right? D. 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 Okay. We're going to slice that off. Um, what next? Humid. Humid. All right. Now what? Fire. Hum humid, humid E? How about this? Iffy. Okay, and then we have the er on there. All right, so for these parts, these parts, and what we would do in class is we'd go through several examples and have students working through this as a group and then having students work through in smaller groups on certain ones of their own, um, be it as a precursor to their homework or for a quiz the next day or something of that nature. In looking at this, 
Um, what we need to do is figure out how do these different parts fit together. So for example, this D, what is it normally attached to is what we would ask. So what does D as a prefix normally attach to? What are some D words? Deconstruct. We have construct and deconstruct. So what kind of word would construct be in terms of part of speech? Verb. Verb. All right. So we get D and it takes this verb and it leaves it as a verb in there when you attach it to it. So deconstruct is still a verb. What about humid? What part of speech is humid? It's an adjective. It's a very humid day out. All right. So we go through about how to figure that out. You've got to put it in context, go back, look at what you just created, and go from there. So we have humid as an adjective in there. What about this iffy? The iffy can be a little bit tricky because people rarely see it hanging out by itself. So you've got to think about possibly prompt them with examples, um, larger classes, the class starts off at 80, is you get people who can shout things out. But here we go from pure to purify, so we can take it from an adjective. It's really pure water to a verb. All right, so this suffix has a very specific job. And then the er, what does the er do? What is it normally attached to for a word? Give me an example. So we, we have bike and biker, work and worker. So it attaches to nouns. It attaches to verbs and makes nouns. So you have teach, I teach every day, I'm a teacher. So it takes it from a verb and makes it into a noun. So we have these different parts. Now if you take a look at this, and we worked through the idea of hierarchy before this, there's only certain orders. If you're going to put these on one at a time, there's only a certain order this can go in. It's restricted by the structure of these different parts that are stored in our mental dictionaries. So if you start off with humid as an adjective in here, the only thing, if we go back to this, the only thing that attaches to adjectives directly is the iffy. So that thing there has to be what that connection is. Working from there, this D can attach to verbs, and the ER can attach to verbs. But there's a bit of a trick, and this is, this is what catches up students with this example and many others like it. Only one of them gets to go first. Which one? And more importantly, why? Does the D go first or the ER go first? The D. Okay, and why? Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, but here we're talking about what the parts go to. Um, you could have humidifier, though. Mm -hmm. And you could have dehumidify. Mm -hmm. So if we put the er on first, what would happen? If we had a humidifier, what would it be? It would be a noun. And D doesn't attach to nouns, it attaches to verbs. So we have to get the D in there first, and our language part of our mind, our mental grammar, is going to build this structure first, and then later build this so that it can be a noun. Working through these examples is, as we are all here to say, much, much better than simply talking about them because it's the practice of the analysis and the practice of the explaining that the students need help with. All right, that's it for me for now. More later. <laughs> OK, um, I'm, uh, I teach this uh, Principles of Marketing course in the business school. The, uh, this is a required course of all business students. Approximately 80% of my students are not going to be marketing majors. And these people are going to view my course as just a god-awful requirement that they wish they didn't have to do. So the, the, the motivation and, and trying, to, you know, trying to pull these people in has is, is been a real challenge. Um, secondly, my class is uh, a mass lecture, 300 students. So you're, you're, you're talking about a you know, very traditional lecture hall 
um, concept and all. So I'll spare you uh, um, all the reasons that led me to doing this, but um, I converted this course to a flipped concept just this past term. So we're just wrapping up now um, my, first <clears throat> my first crack at it. I can tell you that it has uh, exceeded my expectations as far as um, the, the, um, the uh, overall um, uh, what I think the students have been able to get from it, as well as my own personal uh, satisfaction in, in, uh, in doing this course. I have um, distributed a, a leave behind, and I guess for those of you who are watching this on video, if you want to drop me an email, I'll be glad to send you the, the document to, to see. But um, I'd like to just sort of show you how I attempted to, um, to take the concept and, and how to operationalize it into, into this particular course. So um, I, uh, you'll be uh, thankful to know that I'm not really going to go through much of this in any particular detail. But what, um, the way the course is structured is that there are really 12 learning objectives. There are 12 major uh, clumps of information that, that I deliver. And so I've or organized this around each of those 12. And it works out much like yours. It's, it's almost like every week. And when you throw in some exams and this other stuff, you get yourself out to the, to the, to the full term. Um, each uh, learning objective has uh, you know, two or three class sections uh, dedicated to that particular objective. Um, prior to the first class, the students are, uh, are, are asked to, uh, to, to read the uh, corresponding material in the textbook. I post the PowerPoint slides that, that accompany that. Uh, they can look at those or, or not, depending on what their preferences are. Uh, but they also have to take uh, an online quiz. And the uh, online quiz is, is, is designed to try to get them to do it uh, before that class. Uh, the, 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 the quiz is, uh, it goes offline right at the start of class. So if you don't get it, it's gone forever. <clears throat> they miss enough of these and, and they really begin to seriously hurt their grade. So um, then uh, in the uh, actual uh, class experience, uh, there, there are um, no uh, formal lectures that I, uh, I go through. I typically start the class off with introducing whatever that day's exercise is going to be. And um, I, I kind of have two different types of exercises uh, that I use, and I've given uh, some examples of this. So um, just to kind of explain with everybody, um, this grid that I have put out on the second page of this leave behind, this just sort of shows, you know, um, actually this is for the upcoming term. I've been working on my syllabus here. Um, this sort of shows how this works out, you know, class by class, week by week, what exactly I'm doing on, on each of these. And um, so uh, what, uh, uh, what the class sessions uh, typically involve is either what I call an active learning exercise where the students come to class, they, they would have read some material, they would have been familiar with it. The design of the exercise is to sort of somehow demonstrate the application of some co concept of that. So I've put on the bottom of this page an example of what one of these exercises could be like. So you can kind of read through that. What um, the, uh, the thing is that the students will, uh, in some of these exercises, work individually. In other cases, they'll work in groups. It depends on the nature of the exercise and whether a group dynamic is, is, you know, makes it a, a better experience or not. But at the end of that exercise, the students must turn something in to me. So, uh, and that is graded. And uh, you know, so they've got um, you know, uh, th th there's some incentive to try to at least do this, uh, you know, do this seriously and so forth. Um, I'll just point out to you that um, in that exercise that you see here, which was this, it was actually really, really fun, and, and it was a very enjoyable day that when we did this. But uh, you know, even though some of these things are kind of fun-like things, you'll notice here at the very bottom, like what they had to do though was to demonstrate at least three concepts from the chapters that this was sort of tied to. So almost every one of these has some type of a connection. To like, so I'm trying to prove my point is to, to, to what has to go on. In addition to that, 
there is uh, what I call uh, major project work. And so at the very beginning of the course, I form groups. The groups are between four and six people. Um, the, the people have to, as a group, they have to um, pick an item in a grocery store. And um, only one group can work on any one type of item to cut down on people you know, doing the same type of thing. And then each week that we go through as we're covering, let's say, uh, market research or distribution or whatever, there is some assignment that relates to that with their product. So it requires them to, uh, to, to you know, do, do some additional work. Now, these projects have both a, uh, a, a, a pre-component where they're supposed to come into the classroom with something that is done. And then as a group, they are an attempt to synthesize all that and they turn something else in along with those individual assignments. So if a person doesn't make that class, then when the group turns in the assignments, there won't be that individual's contribution other than if they've given it to someone and told them to turn it in, which you know, I haven't seen that happen too much actually, so you would think they would. Um, in any event, um, so I've, I've indicated here like what like is an example of that. So I've sort of shown what is the, you know, the thing that they have to do. This particular assignment was done in the, um, in, in the uh, area of um, consumer behavior, which was one of the topics that we had to deal with. So what they had to do is they had to go online to a, one of these, um, uh, you know, um, Myers-Briggs-like um, uh, typologies and take the survey and then uh, print out their results for them personally. And then they, uh, you know, they had to bring that into class. And then you can see then that what the in-class exercise was like. So what I would do in this class in the very beginning would be to, um, you know, to say, OK, you know, now that you've sort of done this all, here's what, uh, um, you know, here's what I'd ask you to do. And then they have to turn that in uh, to the class. So what I do is um, I have actually a, um, a, a teaching assistant, uh, which is uh, super critical for this. So you can start to be imagine here how much grading is involved in this. It's, it's, uh, I have about 60 groups, and so um, that's about 120 assignments a week that have to be graded. So it, it, she keeps really busy. But what we have is a, one of these rolling file cabinets with folders, for like much like what you've got here, and they know to put those things in those folders and she grades those things as a, you know, an ongoing type of basis. Um, so then uh, the other component would be uh, in-class exams. There's four of them that uh, where, um, you know, typical uh, exam, but this is where, uh, you know, it's kind of my real assessment as to what goes on. So um, I've put down at the bottom of this sheet how that all of these components that I've just described, like the relative weighting of these, um, so you can kind of get a feel for um, how this is. Um, I can tell you that in terms of the exams, because I've been really, um, really nervous about this, my average is, believe it or not, an 80 point something for all four exams. And it appears as much to be as normally distributed as you could, you could hope for, which is what I was hoping for, was that I, I would have been really nervous if it either had skewed up really high or had gone down really low. So I know that in terms of the exam things, it's, it's, it's like that. And what I think is going to happen, I haven't started the grading yet, but what I think will happen is the students that have not done well on the exams have probably also not fully participated in the course. Um, and my guess will be that my final grading is going to follow that, that distribution also. So I imagine they, you know, they, they, they kind of dig themselves a hole by not doing these things. And then the exam just you know, confirms that, that, that type of an experience. So um, that, that's been um, the, um, just a, the mechanics of how I've chosen to, to sort of do this. Um, my class experience is, 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 is kind of wild. I mean, it, uh, everybody felt, you know, files in. They, um, you know, it takes me two or three minutes to explain whatever that activity is. And then from that point, I turn the microphone off and I just spend the time circulating through the room and, you know, going up to people, uh, you know, uh, being available to help them with it. 
Uh, what I've learned is that what I have to do, though, is, is actually just butt in. So it'll be like I'll come up to a group and I'll pick up the paper and say, so let me see what you're doing, mm -hmm. and, and then kind of um, give um, some sort of feedback towards that. So it's very loud. It's very busy. Um, you know, there's, there's um, all kinds of things that go on. About half of these uh, have some type of a formal debrief at the conclusion of it, sort of saying this was what we were trying to do and here's what, you know, here's the implication of that or, or something. Others are, 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 not, um, a lot, are not much like that. Um, the, uh, uh, to me, the, um, it, it was interesting when you talk about the, um, you know, talking about the pros and the cons of this and all, and I, um, I worked with Amy and Jenny a lot on uh, trying to develop this course, and it was uh, kind of a, a funny thing where I bumped into Jenny, um, I don't know, it was about five weeks, six weeks into the thing, and we were talking, and one word led to another, and out of that, um, we kind of did an impromptu sort of focus group. So in one of the classes, I just randomly picked about 10 students or so, and Amy and Jenny uh, took them to the, um, to like in the foyer of the, of the building that we're in, and while I was doing the class, I excused the students from it, but while I was doing that, they were conducting like a kind of an informal focus group from it. And the one comment that I got that really made me feel really great was at least one person said that she actually felt that she was getting more attention from me. And this is a class of 300. Like, that's, that's a very cool thing to, to have happen. So I do feel that I've, 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 I have made the experience more meaningful uh, to people. Um, downsides of it, um, without a doubt, it is substantially more work. I, I mean, beyond your wildest dreams, it is more work. If you think you're working hard to do like a I speak, you listen kind of class, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet when you come into doing this kind of thing. And the grading is almost overwhelming. I mean, and I, I need to kind of think about that some, and maybe there's some way I can better use technology to, to kind of help. Um, with that. Um, the other comment that I'll make is um, something that uh, I can't think of. Who's the person, the biology prof? That Michelle Williams. Yes, okay, so there was this, this other person who uh, has been doing this type of work, and um, she had this comment to me that really helped. So I, when I was designing this, um, she, uh, I, I kind of felt like, okay, one of my biggest challenges are that, you know, I've got so many of my students that are figuring out how can they circumvent what I'm trying to do? Like, how can they basically, you know, not do the work that I'm asking them to do and probably get an A in the process? Uh, but at least, you know, they, there's this, this almost like a cat and mouse game. And I feel as if, like, it's whack-a-mole. You know, no matter what I try to do, <laughs> they're always one step ahead of me on this. And, um, I, I could just see when I started to talk to her and as I was setting this up, I'm thinking, you know, this is just, this is open season for abuse, you know, for, for students that are going to attempt to, you know, um, you know, game the system in a sense. And her advice really helped me a lot and she said, you got to let it go. You, you, you're never going to get on top of that. There's always going to be those kinds of students. Just give it up. I mean, Stop doing it. So that's why I don't do attendance or these others. I have no doubt there are students that are working with Confederates in the class to turn in their assignments and all that stuff. I just, you know, I've just given it up, and and my blood pressure has dropped uh, <laughs> considerably, and um, it, that seems to be um, working well. The uh, the last comment that I'll make is that um, so I I don't know if there is a traditional model for this, although, uh, um, Tara, I've heard, I heard you mention where you have some pre-recorded lectures, right? Um, so that, uh, uh, in, in doing this, I, I kind of didn't get this idea until the summer, and in trying to get everything done, I just simply didn't have the time to, to try to, let's say, pre-record um, my lectures. And so what I did was just post the PowerPoint slides post the textbook, or, or said the textbook stuff and said, you know, have at it. Now the PowerPoint slides, as you know, like in PowerPoint, there's like a comments field, and there were extensive comments on each slide. So almost like a, um, 
almost like a, a, a written narration that would be on part of that. And um, I kind of had, um, I, I didn't feel really great about that, uh, but actually I, it worked very, very well for me. And maybe um, marketing is the type of material where you just can read it and get it, but I actually don't think I'm ever going to uh, record those lectures. And part of it was because I think that there's, uh, it, you really have to work hard to make those engaging. The, the, you know, just sitting in front of a computer screen passively and hearing this disconnected voice coming at you saying, you know, like talking the slides is, is tough to make and I don't know how you do it, but you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it seems like the students are, are being able to, to go through it and I, I'd like to think, I don't have any data on this, but I'd like to think that those students that are really on top of it and are fast learners are probably going through this material really quickly and mastering it and then there's others that are going to have to take a fair amount of time, but when you pre-record it, you've now committed everyone to that same amount of time, right? It's like you can't, you know, you can't time compress that or whatever. So that's, that's my story. Tara, since Mike mentioned the recording, do you want to talk about how you do that? Yeah. Sure. So the recorded lectures are not your, they're not the same 50-minute lectures that I did before. They are um, segments. Um, and so th there might be a 15-minute lecture, there might be a 40-minute lecture, there might be a 27-minute lecture. So it varies based on the, the content. And some of the topics there's a lecture for, and some of the topics there is um, guided reading. So I've assigned certain pages in the, the textbook and provided them with either more specific objectives or with just kind of questions to help them get through the, the chapter. Um, and I don't do both. So like one of the things that we talk about is warts. It's, it is a non-prescription medication <laughs> course. So um, for wards, they don't have to, there's no online lecture for that. They just read the textbook chapter. That chapter is pretty short, very straightforward. And so that chapter was easy to do just as a reading assignment. Um, cough cold is a little bit more complicated. So there's actually a, a lecture for that and not any assigned reading. So I've broken it down so that it's not too, um, cumbersome as far as the lectures. Um, I do forget to remind them that it's a three credit hour course and they only are in the classroom two credit hours because every year there are multiple complaints about the work they have to do um, on the final evaluation of the, the course. But they forget that, they, that it's a three credit hour course and they actually, it's a little less online time than, mm -hmm. than a full credit hour. But, um, and then some of the lectures too, like I was able to do on my PowerPoint, like I'll have different things that will pop up, I'll circle different things to try to keep it a little bit more um, interactive, um, but it's just, it's still just a basic lecture. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them like that because then they're allowed to go, they can, allows those that want to to go back and view it as many times as they need to. Um, there's oftentimes comments too that it takes them a long time to do it. You know, I can't help it if you have to listen to every slide three times <laughs> to get off the notes or that they're writing things verbatim, but some of them do report that it takes them a long time to go through that, but that's their own problem. Are you yes. using Camtasia? Yes, questions? I used Camtasia. And I just sat in my office with a headset on and, and recorded them. When I first started doing it, I had to do it multiple times because random things would pop up. I'd forget to turn my phone off and it'd ring in the middle. <laughs> And so the first time I did it, it was <laughs> very challenging. <laughs> and I agree, it is an insane amount of work. Do not do this if you are wanting to work less. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it's not less work. It's a lot of preparation to mm -hmm. um, get things ready for, for class. And that amount of work, too, goes unrecognized probably by, by your peers. But it definitely goes unrecognized by the, by the students. Um, a lot of the comments, or not a lot, there will always be comments on the evaluations that you are no longer teaching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are teaching themselves now. So. <laughs> Have all of you had that the same comment with, from students? Or? I'll find out here in yeah, a this year, couple you of weeks. Your first time. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, so I don't know. I'm sure I, I am certain that I, I will, um, that I, I'll, I'll get that. Um, I, I would say as just a, um, 
point of advice is that if you were thinking of doing this, um, uh, the, this um, little focus group thing I did uh, about, I don't know, it wasn't quite halfway through the course, was, was really, really great. Because one of the things that I, I wasn't feeling like I was getting any feedback, I mean, no one was saying much to me. I really couldn't tell if, you know, are we getting it? I was looking at, the, at, at like, test results and this type of thing, but I, I, I was, it was a big disconnect. And it was very, very helpful. Plus, there were some points that, that you guys, that, that they heard that, I, that were, were rather illuminating. Like, for example, one thing was that, for the most part, the PowerPoint slides, I just took the publisher slides that came with the textbook and uploaded them. I mean, I didn't do it. So it's not uncommon for, like, if you've got, like, two chapters, there could be 100 slides, easily. I mean, and the students were saying, it's overwhelming. I mean, like, what's important? What, what should we be focusing on? And part of that was, I think, um, I wasn't thinking this through on my part, and I, I, I should have been looking at those slides a little more carefully. But part of it is that I needed to think about um, you know, providing a little bit more guidance and a little bit more structure uh, to that. So what I started doing in, in the class would be to, you know, to kind of say to people, here's the key things that you need to be focusing on. As I'm looking into this next term, I'm trying to really radically change those PowerPoints so that it's, it's much more manageable. It might be more along the lines of what you might have in a lecture. I mean, you don't, I don't, at least I can't present a lecture of 100 slides. And I mean, you, you couldn't do that. You might have 20 or, uh, I mean, that, and so I, I'm trying to distill it down and um, make it much more meaningful to people. Back to Kirk. Um, I had a question. I'm going to need the computer back up. Sure. But um, I'm going to, I had a question about review of the exams about a week after. What, what goes on in those sessions? So what I um, did is uh, uh, the students uh, take, would take the exams, and then I um, had as like an optional thing where I would devote class time and go through the exam question by question. You know, this was the right answer. This was why the right answer was what it was. And I, I did it for two reasons. And the one was because if I didn't, I would be inundated with emails or, or students coming to saying, well, why did I get this one wrong? So that, that part of it, but also I'm trying to make it into more of a learning, mm -hmm. uh, a learning experience. And, and it's a little easier in my case because it was your standard multiple choice questions. It's, right. you know, there, there is sort of a right or wrong answer to things. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't do it. I kind of ran out, uh, well, I have it set up for, the, for that. It's much harder to do that when you're on a Tuesday, Thursday teaching schedule because right. you don't have that much class time. Or, or, that it, many classes? It, yeah, it's, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but like I have a really hard time going back and forth to those. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I either, like this course was designed around Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I feel like with now when I go to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm stretching it. You know, like it's, it's yeah. I, you know, I just can't adapt well. So. Okay. All right. Um, obviously, class size is going to make a difference here because I've taught up to 120. Um, I like I normally start about 80 and then drop off. Um, I'm not sure what attrition is in your classes. How many people drop? Mine? Yeah. None. None. You drop your out of pharmacy school. See, I, this is where I have, so, I have sophomores, right? Even. I have sophomore through, I have about 20%, 20 to 30% every semester. Um, and here's some, of, here's some of the reasons why. Um, so I don't have any PowerPoints. I've never had any PowerPoints. I've been doing this, by the way, since I came here in 98. And I, we, we do and work on activities in class. Um, there are little segments where they need help with something and I, sing and dance for that time. And if they're really exhausted, if they're, they came back after this um, Thanksgiving break just beaten, they all look, honestly, they just all look tired and hung over um, on, on, you know, and I'm not sure why. But, you know, I helped them out that day by a little more singing and dancing. Um, I used to do online quizzes through eCampus, and it works well enough. The trouble was that everyone began assuming it was an online class, so no one's 
came Game to class. Time. So that's a problem. So they have to come to class because we have paper-based quizzes in class. And it's a tremendous amount of grading. Um, sometimes you can make the quizzes easier than not. Um, it's an English department, so um, very few multiple choice questions. None of the tests are multiple choice. Most of the quizzes have written answers that go with them. Um, so, and some extent of writing the homeworks also. Um, the content has to, the content that's outside of class, be it the lectures, be it a book, has to fit what you're going to do in class in that way. Um, for years and years, I've modified stuff to fit in certain ways, and it's always hard when you start arguing with the glossary in the back of the book. Yes, I know it says that's the definition. No, it's not right for these reasons. Let me explain. That's a little tricky. I finally gave up and wrote my own book. So, that's a bit extreme. If you do that, though, the amazing conclusion I have from that is that they don't read it any more than they would have read any other book. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, they still come to class every fresh crop expecting you to provide the information to them. Mm -hmm. I'm not providing the information. Here, do these things. We don't know what to do. Well, then get reading in class. Let's go and you work on this. And some do and some are not prepared. Um, I, you know, 20% attrition rate and another 10 to 20% fail every single semester. And then they come back and they try it again. I suspect no one... And what fails in TV class. Right. Oh, please, please. Actually, I think it relates to what all three of you said about that students have a difficulty because they're so used to a traditional approach. Mm -hmm. Yes. With this uh, different approach. Do you explain, provide a rationale for why you're doing what you're doing? And does that make sense? Do they accept that or just kind of not? Heads. They seem to accept it, and some of them have behaviors that then work well, and some of them just, no, not at all. They will try to read the day or two before the, day or two before the test, and they um, fail the midterm. So. The first class session, I devote um, part of the first hour to reviewing how the course is set up, why it's set up like this, uh, what the, the benefits are, what their responsibilities are, but yeah, so some of them get it and some of them like it and some of them just hate yeah. it. I've given up I, on I, trying to please everybody. Yeah, I, I recall saying a few things about it, but the one thing that I said that um, uh, that I think, I, and I did this more for shock value than anything because I was trying to make sure to get them the idea that this was a different thing. And I said, um, I want you all to step for a minute. I want you to think about how you prefer to learn. And for those of you who like to sit and listen, you need to drop this course. I said, you, you will, this is a bad course for you. This is not designed for your, your type of learning style. You, you are going to as much teach yourself this as I am going to guide it. And I, and I did it that direct because I, I needed them to recognize that they were dealing with something different. Surprisingly, they seemed to have adapted. They didn't, um, you know, they, I, I kept thinking, oh, this is going to be, for the first couple of weeks, I'm going to have to keep they they seem to like if you just tell them they they got the they got the drill. I might add on top of all that, uh, my course was a beta course for the new e campus, so they were having to also learn the new e campus thing, which isn't that difficult. But it was you know I really brought it on them <laughs> as far as that is that so. But. Um, let's see. Uh, last thing, this one, you know, you can help the students out. You can provide these opportunities. In some cases, they might be a little more compelled to uh, fulfill them. In my case, they just, you know, the ones who don't want to that semester, oh, it's not going well, just taking the W, coming back again. I see some of my students some um, three and four times before they finish out. And then they make it through, or, or they don't. Um, but it's, the onus is on them. Um, there's, th in terms of stu students who do best, sophomores do best in this particular class. The juniors and seniors do, especially the seniors, do much, much worse. 
because the sophomores treat it as a regular class. They come every day, they do the homework, they do the quizzes. If they can do those activities and they're prepared <laughs> for the tests, then they do great. Um, someone always gets an A plus in the class, a 96.5 and above. But then I have people getting 30s mm -hmm. um, because they didn't do these activities mm -hmm. every single semester. So, yeah. I think one of the um, things I remember from some of the reading that I did on this, and I think you kind of heard this from, from all of us, is that one of the concepts that is important to this as is uh, multiple uh, Elements or in the in the in the, or multiple deliverables and all. I mean, mm -hmm. if you were to look at my course and count up, it's it must be 50 or so. I mean, you should see the grade book in eCampus. I mean, there's so many damn columns across. It yep. takes you, but but the point is that it's like lots and lots of um, of, of um, assessments or uh, things that are are being done. Um, have a number in my yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, a number of in, in my course as well, as far as the the individual assessments, the team assessments, um, some of the in class activities they get points for, um, and then a variety of other different things that they do mm -hmm. as well. Um, especially with mine, with the using the with a lot more team based types of things in the class, there are a number of most of their grade comes from individual things, so they cannot rely completely on their um, teammates mm. to get through the, the course. Um, and I do stress to them at the beginning and throughout the semester that they will be pharmacists and they will need to be able to talk to patients about mm -hmm. um, these things. And the fortunate thing for me is that it is a non-prescription medication course, so the students don't, I don't have to sell it to them. They know they need to, to know it. Um, and so the content they they like, um, hmm. they're just not all on board with the way it's it's mm -hmm. taught now. But they're they're third year students, and so kind of like what Kirk said, they're they're set in their ways, I think. Yeah. And people have been lecturing to them for their whole entire careers, yeah. and this is a is new, and they do perceive it as um, as too much work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot more relaxing to be listening and being entertained by the material rather than having to at 10 in the morning which is really early for them um, step up and yeah step up and be active um, you know, within that practice coaching metaphor imagine going to an athletic practice and like eh, you know just talk, tell me about what I'm supposed to do in the pool I, I don't really need to get in there and do laps do I uh, no no I like the coaching metaphor I might use that <laughs> I have three get out of jail cards. I mean, that's out of what well, I can tell you. It's, it's, it's like 30, 30 things, and it's three, um, three misses they're allowed. So, and if they make it, if they do everything, then it's like extra credit. Yeah, it's similar. I have 15 quizzes, 15 homeworks and they can drop their two lowest grades for either of those. Okay, that's so, another, that's the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly the same idea. I have, um, if they miss like the, the IRATs and TRATs, so the, um, the quizzes that are in class, if they have a legitimate excuse, if they have an excused absence, which they get through our student services, so if they were sick and they at least let me know that they were sick, then I do allow uh, a makeup for the individual and they just get the team score. If they just overslept, they get zeros. We have a probably similar policy with the mm -hmm. lab is that they have to be there every day, but we don't want you making everybody else sick. Yeah, so, so yeah, they have a, if they're ill, I do allow for makeup. If if they're not, mm -hmm. how many did you say you had? How many? The individual, sessions? the quizzes. There's six. And the first, because this is a new. Um, new concept for them and they're not used to, to it. The first one is um, a practice one. So 
five of them count towards their their grade mm -hmm. and so the first one is 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 ungraded they do well on it so i know they've right. they prepared for it and it's on headache so it's you know acetaminophen and ibuprofen and naproxen so it's simple uh, you know easier topics mm -hmm. and so that gives them some practice with okay did i prepare for this quiz the correct way um and also gives them practice with the team based figuring out how to their team dynamics are going to work. So the first one's the practice one. I might add, just as you're saying it, Tara, I forgot to say. So my quizzes, the online quizzes, they can take them up to three times, and it's the same questions. And I guarantee you, I know what they're doing. They're just going into the first one cold, and mm -hmm. they and the and the problem is it like they really have to work at it, looking up the answers because they're not just a straight regurgitation of things. So if they spend an hour figuring out the right answers and then put it in, yep. they've learned something. Exactly. Like my expectations yep. are they are yep. going to get 100 on the quiz. Mm -hmm. Although I, I, I did have students that would only take it once and, and fail it and not take it again. I, I, you know, I, I don't know what their issue is. Yeah, I, I think that's really good. These, these assessments and opportunities are not simply what did you learn, but the process by which they learn. Right. And it's important to see them that way. I have one student this semester who all the homeworks you're supposed to get 100%. You turn it in the right, and you've done it, you get 100% on them, which makes it, by the way, easier to grade. I just make comments about what you could do better. Um, I have one student who turned in only 15% uh, of the homeworks, got a 15% for that. Be it can, is getting passing exam grades will probably not pass the course because of those homeworks because they did, the student did not participate yeah. enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, are the homeworks what's done in class, or is that also additional no. outside homework? This is outside homework, yeah. The in-class work can also be collected, and I just check it to see how things are going. Mm 